St. John chapter 20, starting at verse number 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene, early when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and come to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together. And the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulchre. And he stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet when he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Pay special attention to verse number 8. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. Mary said, He's gone. He's not here. They run to see. And when they saw, they believed. Our thought this morning is run and see. Run and see. It cannot be denied there has been great teachers that have come on the scene throughout the ages. Men who have become great in their own circles and have been deemed great by their teachings. There are those that lean upon those teachings and they follow those teachings that have turned and somewhat have become a religion. But there's something that even though they're good teachings, they're great examples of life, of loving one another, and so on and so forth. The sad reality of those are that those men died. And there's nothing to bring forth concerning their life but their teachings. There's nothing but dust and ashes, so to speak, where the remains were laid down. But when we come to Jesus Christ, we face reality. He too taught very good teaching. Yes. What he taught was anointed as it fell from his lips. Yes. But if all that we lean upon this morning is the basics of his teachings, then we too have somewhat a religion. But if we lean upon the fact that He is alive, there's more, there's not any ashes or dust where He laid, but it's an empty tomb. The reality of the resurrection is where we have our life. It's where we have our real joy. It's where we have our victory. And it's where we overcome the attacks of the enemy that comes against our soul. You see, when trials come, we cannot just simply say, well, you know, I'm standing on the teachings of Jesus. We can stand on the Word of God. 
But the Word would be empty and it would be vain to us if it was not backed by the reality that Jesus Christ is alive. And Him being alive this morning makes His Word still alive. Because what He said in the Scriptures, He's still saying it. What, uh, what, what Confucius said, they're written down, but He ain't saying it right now. What the Buddha said might have been good, and it may have taught men to love and different things, uh, but He's not saying it right now. He's dormant, He's dead, He's laid to rest, uh, and there's nothing but a memory of what He had to say. But when I read what Jesus said, I know that He's still speaking it. And He's still saying it. And it's still alive as it was when He spoke it over 2,000 years ago. When Jesus said, Come unto Me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's alive this morning. And He's still saying it. Yeah. Hallelujah. It's still just as real yeah. as it was because of the resurrection. Because we serve a living God, we have victory over sin. We have victory over discouragement. We have victory over temptations. We have victory because we can call upon the name of one who is alive. Thank you, God. The promises of the resurrection came through the psalmist. Through God speaking through the psalmist, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. I'll not leave your soul in the grave. But I will, uh, shall not suffer that Holy One to see corruption. The prophets, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost in Isaiah 26 and 19, says, Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. He's alive. Somebody said, what? Wait a minute. Is this August or is this April? No, it's August. No, we're not on Easter or sunrise service. But our everyday activity has got to be focused on this reality. We cannot let it be a once in a year thought. And it cannot be a passive thought, but a reality. When I face temptation, when the world scene around me begins to take on more and more corruption. And when politics seems to be uh, mixed and corrupt, and you come to a place where you don't know which way to go, and you don't know what to do, Jesus is alive. He is still alive. Jesus said to His disciples, on the shores of Caesarea Philippi, he asked them a question, who do people say that I am? And they said, well, this prophet, that prophet, but whom do you say that I am? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, don't tell this to anybody because I want you to understand something. I'm going to Jerusalem. They're going to kill me. But in three days, God is going to raise me up. Yes. From that forth time, Jesus began to show unto His disciples that I must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. I want you to go with me into the mind of Peter, John, all these disciples. This is a very spiritual.
spiritual high moment. Jerry, you ever come to a place where it seemed like the whole house was lit up? It seemed like every corner in the sanctuary is lit up with the presence of God. When Jesus asked His disciples, Who do men say that I am? They make these assumptions. And then Jesus asked, Who do you say that I am? And Peter makes this announcement. And Jesus says that flesh and blood have not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. That place had to light up. At this moment, those disciples get a taste of, of this reality that Jesus is not just a good teacher. Come on. He's not just a rabbi. Yeah. Hey, they knew the first time they saw Him, there's something different about Him. Yeah. They knew the first time they laid those nets down, Peter, oh, yeah. James, Andrew, John, uh, the fishermen, and uh, uh, Matthew laid that box, uh, that, that tax collecting John down, uh, uh, Simon the Zealot uh, laid down his rebellious act, yeah. uh, amen, and each and every one of them, Nathaniel, laid down his scholaristic studies uh, and said, I'm going to follow this man. Uh, they knew he was yeah. different. Uh, they knew there's something godly about him, but at this moment they see and experience the revelation that he is the Son of God. He's the Son of the omnipotent living God. But Peter says, Thou art the Christ. But Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to be abused and I'm going to be killed. But the third day, somewhere in Another. It seemed like in this moment of revelation, you'd have thought that got a hold of this and couldn't wait for him to be crucified. You listen to me real close. You'd have thought they got real that they got a hold of that and in their mind saying, I know it's gonna hurt for a little while, but I can't wait for the day when he dies and he comes back because we've been following a man that's alive, but not Jesus can see him. And Peter no doubt sees those eyes as they look upon him. And Peter goes out and weeps bitterly. Weeps bitterly. Jesus has gone on into the trial, falsely accused. The Jews scream, crucify him. Crucify him. Yes. So he's crucified. Nobody at the foot of the cross, the women that followed him. But where's the disciples? Where is not Matthew, where is Matthew, the former tax collector? Where is Nathaniel, the studious scholar, wondering if any good thing can come from Nazareth? Where is Andrew, who first found the Christ and told Peter? We have found Him. They're looking for a Messiah, but they're not looking for one on the cross. 
They're looking for a Messiah to come and empower themselves over the Roman government and get victory in physical matters. We do not have the right to try to get victory in physical matters in our lives until we gain victory in the spiritual man that we know how to deal with that victory that we get in the physical man. What do you mean, Brother Morgan? I mean that if we get victory in the physical realm and we do not have victory in the spiritual realm, we'll equate the victory to ourselves. We'll equate it to somebody around us. But if we've got victory in the spiritual man, then we'll understand that every mountain I'm able to scale is by the grace of God. Every valley that I'm able to live through and come out smiling, I'll equate it to the Spirit of Almighty God. Because I'm right in my soul and I understand we're all joy and all victory comes from. I've got to get around here to my thought. But Jesus, where are they at? John's at the foot of the cross. Jesus gives him exhortation to take care of his mama. And he did. But soon, Jesus dropped his head. He spoke the words, it is finished. The sacrifice has been made. The atonement's made. That needing to appease the anger of God against sin is taken care of. And he died. (laughs) He died. Getting close to the moment the disciples could have been excited about, but they missed it. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea take his body off of that cross. They desired the body of Jesus. They begged the body of Jesus. And they took him and put him in the tomb. Three days later, Mary comes, other gospels list others with her. And there is an order of events of the resurrection that bring all the gospels into harmony. I won't try to bring that to pass this morning. We'll deal with the account in John. But any time you get confused, though, don't worry about it. There's no contradiction. There's an order of events because we wouldn't there. And you got four people writing of what they saw and heard. But God's Word does not contradict itself. But Mary comes to the tomb. And she sees that the stone is already gone. It's gone. And she looks. And she sees that Jesus is gone as well. And so she runs and she tells Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved, believing it is the author of the book of John, who would not call himself by the first person name, but rather that disciple whom Jesus loved. I'd call John this morning the man at the right hand of Jesus. They're at that last supper, and Peter wants to know who is it. And so he gets John to ask him why. Because John's closest to him. He's at his right hand. He had three that you might call would be his specialties. Peter, James, and John. He didn't love those three any more than the others, but I believe these three loved him more than they did. Huh? Love begets love. I said, love begets love. Somebody said, well, I don't know why God blesses so and so more than He blesses me. Maybe they love loving Him more. Maybe they're appreciating Him more. Maybe they're drawing closer to Him so He can. It's hard to bless at a distance. It's hard to kiss and hug 
at a distance. But when you get close, you can't help but be hugged by Him. Hallelujah. When my wife, we're not supposed to hug women, not supposed to hug the inmates in the prison house. And sometimes some of those fellas don't remember that. And Mama Morgan just be holding her hand out to shake their hand. And they'll, they'll go to hug and she'll kind of, don't want to break the rules. She'll kind of shoulder them a little bit. How many times you've been doing God that way? And rather than really hugging the Lord, you give Him a Mama Morgan hug. Which is at a distance. But God don't want a Mama Morgan hug. He wants what you're able to give. But she runs to Peter and John and tell them He's gone. Listen, she did not tell them He's risen from the dead. You've got to take note of that thing. She runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and the other disciple and Jesus loved, saith unto him, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid Him. Run and see, popped in their minds. Let's run and see if what she's saying is true. You, we read that and we think they're running to see that He has risen from the dead. They're running to see if what she said is true. Yes. They're running to see if that tomb is empty and He's out of pocket and we don't know where to find Him. And so they run and see. And when they look in there, they saw the clothes that was wrapped around Him. They saw the linen cloth that was about his head. They saw that he's not there. And they looked and he saw and believed. I have a question. Maybe you can answer me after church. But Brother Keith, was it they believed that he's resurrected or they believed he's gone? There is a difference here. I believe right here at this point they believed He's gone. Because the very next Scripture says, For yet they knew not the Scripture that He must rise again from the dead. How many times are we needing some assurance to rest in our soul, to lift up our feeble hands that hang down, to cause our feeble knees to take joint again and begin to get along our way and find victory in our soul. How many times have we ran to the altar? How many times have we ran to the place of prayer? How many times have we ran to the Word of God just simply to find out if it's what the devil told us that he's not going to answer prayer and there's no use bringing it to him and it's just not going to avail anything and just to simply believe He's not there. But what i got to run and see is that He's not only out of that tomb, but that He is alive and He is well and He is on His throne and He is on the right hand of the Father ever making intercession for the saints. Now it wasn't now Mary Magdalene wasn't the devil coming and telling him he's gone, but it was she was a character in the in the uh, stage of life that hadn't quite grasped what Jesus had already told him. And how many times do we embrace words that people are telling us? who have not quite embraced what Jesus said. Because we're exhorted in the Word of God that we walk by faith and not by sight. We're exhorted in the Word of God that we must believe that He is. And that He is the rewarder of them that seek Him. They ran to see if what she said was so. For as yet they knew not the Scripture 
that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Why did they go to the house? Because they scripture's not open to them. Why do men continually sit on pews of churches that simply teach and preach to them that all you got to do is get saved and that's it? And do not tell them that you can go farther under sanctification. Yes. And you can go farther unto the baptism in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Why do men continue to sit in churches and believe things that limit them from the treasure house of God? that limit them from being able to reach in the treasures of God's Word and be fulfilled in God. Why do men sit on pews and women that teach them you cannot help but sin? You, we can't help but sin. We've got to sin a little every day. It's in our genes. <laughs> Amen. Why when they can come on deeper on the truth that tells them that this is joy unspeakable and full of glory and we can live a life of purity yes. and a life of holiness because the Scripture has not been opened to them because they ran to see if it was just like someone told them, He ain't here. He's not here. Why, why didn't they record Peter saying, well, Mary, reckon where he's at? Wonder where they've taken him. Mary said, I wonder where they've taken him. Now, in the event of all of this, Mary, according to another gospel writer, she stays there and she weeps. And Peter and John's already gone. A man tells her, an angel tells her, why are you weeping? He is risen. She's still crying. And she turns and she sees a figure. Tears in your eyes bother you from seeing clearly. She cannot see who he is. She thinks he's the gardener. Well, if you took him, would you let me know where you laid him? She's looking for a dead man when a live man is standing at arm's reach. Ha! Somebody is looking for a dead man. But you're looking in the wrong direction. If you're looking toward Jesus, you're looking for a man who is alive and well. Yeah. If you are a gardener, uh, if you know where you put him, let me know. And Jesus says, Mary. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus says, Job. Jesus says, Jerry. Jesus says, Fred. Jesus says, Anthony. Yes. Hallelujah. I don't know everybody's name. I said, Sister Bowman. Jesus says, Glory to God. Yes. This. Oh my. When I hear him call my name. Yes. I know yes. it's not the God. Yes. I know Sorry. it's not somebody. Yes. It's not a whole. Thank you. 
them. But he said, go and tell my disciples, I'll go before them unto Galilee. John and Peter ran to see, but they saw not what they needed to see. And they went to the house, but Mary, she ran and told them, and obviously she ran. Peter and John ran and saw her looking for an empty tomb. I'm not looking for an empty tomb this morning. I'm looking for the man that cried out of that tomb. Quickened by the Spirit of God, by the Holy Ghost. Run this morning while everybody stands in the house. I want to tell you this morning, if you need anything from God, don't run to see an empty tomb. Don't run to find a dead man. Run to find that Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. Run to find that He's alive. 